I was lost. Um, my life was a mess, an absolute mess. And slowly uh, and methodically, God worked his way back in. What I'm about to tell you is probably the most bizarre um, evangelistic tool that you will ever hear about. 1111 uh, started many, many years ago when I was 16. Um, I got an alarm clock from my, my girlfriend, and it was one of those new digital alarm clocks. And when I, I first plugged it in, or shortly after that, the numbers 1111 came up, and that became my lucky number. Let's fast forward to 1997. Um, my life was a mess. I was drinking too much, smoking too much, no exercise. Um, my diabetes was out of control. When I went home, um, I had to introduce myself to my kids. The dog would try and bite me. And uh, my wife usually had a to-do list a mile long. So uh, I was very, very unhappy because even though I was working hard, I wasn't even appreciated for the work that I was doing. I happened to be traveling uh, with a coworker who is in human resources. Her name is Debbie. And Debbie is the salt of the earth. And uh, we were doing checks at over 100 stores, so we had a lot of time to spend as, with each other. And we're going across the state of Nebraska on 80 Highway. And uh, I'm telling her all the woes of my life. And all of a sudden, on the clock, on the truck, 1111 popped up. And I said, hey, it's 1111. And she goes, what does that mean? So I explained it to her. Well, she's quiet for about 10 minutes. And then she goes, Don, why don't you use 1111 to get your life in order? I said, what, well, what do you mean by that? She goes, well, you have one of those fancy alarm watches. Why don't you set it to go off at 1111? And at that time, thank God for what you have and pray for what you need. So I did. And I started doing it on a regular basis. Well, um, slowly things started to improve. 11.11 is, during midday, is the busiest time during the day. You know, you're always involved in something, and you need to re be reminded of what's really important in life, and that's God, and your relationship with Him, and the relationship with others. Funny things started to happen, I mean, or unusual things, where a coworker who knew I was praying at 1111, would come up to me and say, hey, my mom's got cancer. Would you mind praying for her? Or my husband and I are on the verge of divorce. Would you mind saying a prayer for me? And you know, we weren't put on this earth to get through this mess by ourselves. And this is a connection point, not only with God, but with other humans that, that just need uh, some extra help need to know that there's support out there. And it's, it's the greatest way to share your faith. The guidelines for 1111 are extremely simple. Number one, you set your watch, your phone, your pager, your computer to go off, an alarm to go off at 1111. And number two, if anybody asks you about 1111, you have to be truthful with them. It's your connection with God. It's the time to thank God for what you have and pray for what you need. The third one is uh, rather bizarre. It's whoever is in the room with you or in the vicinity with you, you have to include them in, in your prayer. And a lot of times God will put you in rooms with uh, people that you don't want to pray for. And you'll find that if you're saying prayers for them, somehow it cures a lot of ailments in there. 
it's about the connection point between you, other people, and God, and, and using that. In the Bible, it says where there are two people um, in his name that he is there. Well, you know, we may not be right next to each other, and we may be spread out all over town, but we're there. And I'm sure that, uh, think of the power of getting every single one of the people in this church, in this county, in this town, in this state, all praying at the same time. Think of the power of what we could achieve and how many people we could touch and help and reach out and let them know that we are Christians. I was lost. Um, my life was a mess, an absolute mess. And slowly uh, and methodically, God worked his way back in through promise keepers, through my wife who's been steadfast with me uh, for 30 years. And just by doing 1111 and opening myself to others and wanting to help them uh, has just made a great difference in my life. Uh, and I want to share it with other people because it works. Good morning. Good morning. And good morning to our Warnell congregation as they worship with us via the simulcast this morning. Uh, just a, a note, um, of course you received, if you're members of the church, you received a letter from Session this past week. If you're not members of the church, the content of the letter essentially is in my newsletter article, and, and hopefully you are receiving our newsletter. You can request that. You can also see it online. Uh, these are important issues that, uh, that we're facing as we look towards our future, and um, our elders are prepared to just take your questions. If you're an active elder, if you would stand up so we can all stare at you for a second. Uh, Bob, Bill, and Alvin, Chuck, and I thought I saw Craig Minnick and Randall Leonard, Meredith Shields. All of them will be at the information booth and at the Warnell campus. All the elders who just stood up will be uh, out at the information booth. The information booth being like where the TV is for Quivira and obviously marked at Warnell. And so we want you to, thank you, you may be seated, thank you. Uh, we want you to, to feel free to ask a lot of questions. You will be getting more information, I think, within this next week in terms of the process. There will be a number of town hall meetings uh, where we'll invite all of church. We'll have uh, multiple meetings at each campus at different times, hopefully on Sundays and, and Saturdays. Uh, so there will be a lot more coming. But I just wanted you to know that these elders are here at both campuses to speak with you as you have questions this morning. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for... I thank you for this day... I thank you for the opportunity we have to worship together. I thank you that through this reality of prayer, that you are already at work in the lives of each person, that you've brought them to this church this morning to speak into their hearts, that they might encounter you, and that they might grow together. That as a church, we may be in your hands as a tool to impact people's lives with the kingdom. And I pray that you'll have your way in this hour with each person. It's in the name of Christ I pray. Amen. I met Don Bribe uh, a couple, well, I've met him a long time ago, but we had lunch together a few weeks before Christmas, and he shared this story with me about 11-11. And I was so moved by it that I, I sent our folks over there to, to interview Don and to to bring this to your attention, there's a few things I really like about it. Uh, number one, it's very simple. Each person here at our church could set their watch, their PDA, cell phone, computer, whatnot, to, to remind you at 11.11 every day to simply to pray, to thank God for what you have, and to ask God to help you with what you need, to pray for the people that are in your midst and whatever other things are, are on your heart. And I love the fact that it would unify the church in prayer. 
I love the fact that it's something that's very doable and that it happens in our real life world at 11, 11 a.m. all week long. And whatever it is, that thing that you do, whether you're at work, in school, uh, whoever you're with, that it would, it would be a constant reminder that, that God hears our prayers, that God is active in our lives where we are. And uh, so I want you to be thinking about that. I'm going to come back to it at the end of the message. We're on week six of our nine-week series entitled, What Are We Doing Here? Obviously, the, the whole theme of this series has been devoted towards understanding what our mission is and how we accomplish that here at Colonial. Our mission is to help people become passionate, selfless followers of Christ, and we accomplish it that here at Colonial specifically by creating environments where people encounter God, grow with others, and impact people. And we've been unpacking that for you the last couple of weeks. Uh, Specifically, we're on week three of, of what does this environment look like to grow with others? Now, if you'll remember from the first week when we were talking about creating these environments where people grow, we identified that there are five key catalysts for spiritual growth. And obviously, in these environments where we, we're asking people to participate, to grow with others, we want to uh, expose you to those key catalysts. And here they are. Number one, personal engagement with the Bible. Number two, understanding core Christian doctrine. Number three, developing personal spiritual disciplines. Number four, living life in authentic Christian community. And number five, serving primarily in the midst of the poor. Now, I've address the first four, and you would think I would do number five, but I'm not, not today. Uh, The next three messages are all developed towards that serving uh, others part of of spiritual growth, and it is the third environment that we're going to talk about. But this morning, I want to touch on on one last uh, reality of being in life together, of growing together, and that is this concept of prayer specifically unified prayer and the resulting movement of God that happens when people pray. Because in my life, uh, seeing God move as a result of people coming together in prayer has been one of the, the key catalysts for me personally to grow in my faith. And so I want to, to look at that for a little bit uh, this morning. Um, I want you to think in terms of a God story. God stories are stories that are told by those people who have witnessed a profound, unmistakable, miraculous, supernatural act of God. I don't know if you've heard many God stories in your life, but hearing God stories and witnessing those God stories happening in my life have been a tremendous means of growth. A lot of times these stories involve healing from a medical condition or deliverance from bondage or captivity of some kind. Sometimes the story is just this profound change that comes about in the life of a person as they encounter God. They just experience a 180-degree turn in their lives. Other times, the stories simply bear testimony to God's intervention into the normal human routine of life in such a powerful, clear way, whether through timing, through what we perceived as seemingly uh, seemingly chance encounters that that we... (laughs) We just look at it and say, there, there's no accident there. There's no, there's no mistake that God moved. Um, why is this so important? I think it's important because inside each and every one of us, we desperately desire to believe that God is powerful. And we desperately desire to see God's power really to experience the, the signs and wonder of the supernatural reality of God. We, we really want our faith in God to be something more than, than information or data or even just history. We want to experience the supernatural power of God working in and through our lives. And I think the scripture speaks to this, and I want us to go back to Acts 2, to the picture of the early church, beginning with verse 42, because there's <clears throat> there's a little line here that I think it's really easy to skip over, but I want us to go back and spend a little time looking at it. If, if we start at verse 42, we read about the early church. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. And this is everything we've been talking about summed up in a nutshell. The, the, the teaching of the Bible and sound Christian doctrine, the life together in, in fellowship, the worship the breaking of bread, the sacrament, and prayer. Now, do you see what comes next in verse 43? 
Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. This is the inevitable natural result of a church where people are growing in their faith, doing all of these things that we talked about that, that, that lead people to spiritual growth. But the inevitable result is that everyone was filled with awe at the miraculous signs and wonders that was happening through the life of the believers. And I want to look at that a little bit more. This word awe is a big deal. It's, it's not a small thing. Awe is a word that describes something out of the ordinary, something that is extraordinary, something that's not simply natural but is above natural, that is supernatural. Awe is what, what blew so many people away and drew them into the church to say, what is going on? And we can read about some of the signs and wonders that were being accomplished through the disciples. The, the Bible is full of that, uh, that, that, that were given power by God to, to, to do healings, to uh, cast out demons. There, uh, there are so many stories of uh, things like Paul being bit by a poisonous snake and he doesn't get sick or die, that Peter and Paul were both used by God to bring people who had been dead back to life. So when it comes to spiritual growth... I think we all would agree, if I could just see somebody who's dead be brought back to life, I'd believe. You know, my spiritual growth would go right through the roof. If somehow we could witness uh, some miracle, if we could witness that, then we would believe. Then, we would, then, then our faith would grow and we, we would be fully devoted followers of Christ, right? Well, probably not. You see, the Bible's full of stories. I mean, in fact, the whole, most of the book of Exodus is one story after another of, of the people of God at that time being in terrible situations. They cry out and complain to God. God rescues them through some supernatural act. And within 24 hours, what are they doing? They're doubting God. They're crying and complaining again. According to the, 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 the witness of Scripture, we're really kind of a, a hard sell. And what's typical of our human nature is that we hold our faith out in front of God like a carrot. And we say, you know what, God, if you would just rescue me from this situation, if you would just, you know, work your little supernatural miracle thing, then I will believe. And I would say that that's probably not the way that it works. In fact, there's a lot of scripture that speaks to that. If you look at Matthew 12, 38, the gospel writer records an episode where the Pharisees and Sadducees approach Christ and they put him to the test by asking him to give us a sign, show us a miracle, do one of your little, your things. And Jesus is visibly perturbed and responds, a wicked and adulterous generation looks for a miraculous sign, but none will be given it except the sign of Jonah. Let me come back, I'll come back to that in just a second. But what I want you to see is that Jesus does not care to be put to the test. That's not how faith works. In fact, the enemy of faith tried the same tactic with Jesus. Do you remember? In, in the wilderness for 40 days, Jesus uh, is confronted with the enemy, with, with Satan. And how did he tempt Jesus? He tempted him to do a miracle. He said, hey, if you're so hot, if you're the son of God, turn these stones into bread. If you're so hot, if you're so supernatural, if you're big God himself, then why don't you throw yourself off of this high place? Because, you know, the scriptures say that uh, God will command his angels concerning you and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus grits his teeth and says, it is also written, do not put your God to the test. God's stories do not result from us putting God to the test. The creator of the universe is not to be trifled with. We can't manipulate God into performing a miracle upon our request or say, you know, if you will do this, then I will believe. But God does act in powerful, supernatural ways throughout history. And we read about these miracles all throughout the Bible. In fact, the heart of our faith is based on a supernatural act, a miracle, the sign of Jonah. What is the sign of Jonah? Jesus describes that in Matthew 12, 40. He says, For as Jonah was three days and nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. 
the ultimate sign, the defining supernatural act of God, the God story is at the point when Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is dead and buried three days in the tomb, and then he is risen, resurrected, the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. It is at the heart of our faith. It is a supernatural act, and we have no need to apologize for that. God is above the natural world, supernatural. God is infinite. We are temporal. God is independent. We are dependent. God is God. We're not. But our problem as 21st century believers is this. We're increasingly uncomfortable with the supernatural God because we don't see supernatural on a daily basis. We, we don't know anything. We can't relate with dead people coming to life or blind people receiving their sight. So we increasingly doubt God's existence and we certainly uh, maybe, even if we acknowledge that God exists, we doubt the power of God in our lives, in our church, does that mean that God is unbelievable because we can't see the supernatural? Or does it mean that we can't see the supernatural because we don't believe in God? Is God still acting in powerful supernatural ways within history even now? Well, yes, absolutely he is. How can we see that? How can, we, how can we have the eyes to bear witness to his supernatural activity, to these God stories that are happening in our midst? There is only one way, and that is prayer. 2 Chronicles 7, 14 states, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will forgive their sins and I will heal their land. Every great God story begins with these words. I prayed, we prayed, the church prayed, and then God moved. God moves in response to prayer. We don't manipulate his movement. We're not the cause of his movement, but God says in his word, if my people will repent and if they will pray, if they will confess their sins and turn from their wicked ways, I will move. I will move to bring forgiveness. I will move to heal their land. Many of you um, will remember the God story I shared with you about a year ago where God had been working on me about people who were trapped in sexual uh, slavery, the sex trafficking industry. For whatever reason, that was just something that kept popping up on my radar screen. I was on an airplane I prayed to God, okay, fine, you know, use me, send me. I, I'm sorry I haven't done anything. I, I don't even know what I can do, but I'm, I'm in. And within 30 minutes, I was having this conversation with a young woman who was a victim of sex trafficking here in the Kansas City area. And that conversation led eventually to the arrest of the five sexual predators from Independence, Missouri. And that story received national headlines. And I call that a God story because what happened after that prayer was nothing short of a miracle. And these kind of God stories are happening all the time. I remember when I was a student at Wake Forest University, Dr. Charles Talbert, my New Testament professor, I mean, he was just old and white-haired. I thought he probably looked a lot like God. You know, <laughs> when you're a freshman in college, you think those guys are just so amazing and but, you know, he was so intelligent and cerebral and academic and all of that. And you never really know what's happening emotionally or, or experientially in the lives of professors. They kind of keep it all about the, the text and the different things. But one day he stepped out from behind his notes and he said, um, let me tell you something. Many of you doubt the, the power of God. But don't ever doubt the power of God. He said, I, I was a young pastor back in my 20s, and uh, we were playing church league softball, and I got terribly hurt. I, I did something terrible to my knee. It, it blew up bigger than a balloon. I, I couldn't move it. I was just in excruciating pain. And my wife came into the room, and she prayed to God, and she laid hands on my leg, and it was healed. And I remember as a 19-year-old, 
freshman at Wake Forest thinking, whatever. <laughs> but after four years of being with Dr. Talbert, of meeting his wife, of knowing them, I realized he was telling the truth. This happened. This was a God story, a supernatural act of God that happened in his life. And it, it, it changed me. It, it encouraged my faith. It helped me to grow to realize God's still doing things in this world in a powerful supernatural way. It, there are so many books that, that give testimony to God's stories. One that it really inspired me many years ago was the book Fresh Wind, Fresh Fire by Jim Cimbala. He's a pastor. He took this little church, Brooklyn Tabernacle, uh, in just kind of the, the inner core uh, slum area of New York City. They had 26 members left. They're mostly homeless people and prostitutes. The, the church was about to be foreclosed on. He did everything he knew to do to be a pastor, and nothing was working. And finally, one night, he just came to the front of the church and invited those 26 people to just get on the floor and to pray to God in desperation. And an anonymous envelope slid under the door with the payment that they needed. And that church today has 6,000 members. And they continue to get on the floor and pray every Tuesday night just as they did that first night. Our own Mildred Abbott, who's currently in the hospital, she's pushing 90 years old. Uh, she's about this tall. But Mildred has more God stories, and she's written them down. It's just the story of her life being one big God story. And I've read what she's written, and it's just an unbelievable testimony to the fact that God continues to move in the lives of believers in a powerful, supernatural way. Now, what I want you to understand about all of this language, about prayer and about the movement of God and supernatural, all of that, here's what it always comes to. Here's what all of this that we've been talking about in this series comes to, whether we're in the environment of, of encountering God, growing with others, impacting people, there's always one end to all of that, to all of our lives, actually, and certainly our life as a church, and that is this, that God receives glory, that God is lifted up. You see, if Jim West is lifted up, there's nobody who's going to have hope for their life because of that. Or if you are lifted up, or even the great name of our church is lifted up, it means nothing. The world is not saved by you or me or our church. It is only when God is lifted up and exalted in our lives, through our worship, through everything that we do, that people find hope, that people are drawn to him. And the only way that I know of for God to receive the glory in our lives, both individually and corporately, is for us to pray. A unified prayer. A prayer that anticipates a movement from God. A prayer that has all the nature of 2 Chronicles 7, 14, that, that we will humble ourselves, that we will confess and repent, that we will turn from our wicked ways, and that we will desperately pray to God in a unified voice, that he received glory through us. And let me tell you something. When that happens, you will see God. You will see God working in your life in ways you never believed, and you will see God working in the life of this church in a way you, never, you would never believe. It's not that God's not working. It's that we don't have the eyes to see what he's doing unless we pray. And so I am asking each of you, and I know this seems a bit, hmm, I don't know, weird, but I, I really do want to encourage all of us to follow Don's lead and simply to set your watch, your PDA, your computer, wherever you will have some reminder that, that at one minute of every day, we will be together. We will be unified in prayer together. Pray for God to simply receive your gratitude for the blessings you have in your life. And then pray for what you need. Pray for the people in the room, in the elevator, in the classroom, wherever you are, in the car. But let us be united in prayer. And I would ask you to pray for me. And pray for your elders as we lead the church through uncharted territory. The unified prayer of Christians is the means by which God receives glory. And when we pray, 
God promises he will move. Pray with expectation, not as a test, but with full confidence that God's power is, continues to be a reality that, that changes lives and transforms communities. And I want you to remember this in closing, that what's going on in your life right now Everything that's going on in your life right now is the making of God's story. It doesn't matter how much you're suffering, how much you're, you're going without, all the fear, all of the crisis, even the boredom that you think that you have, teenagers, all of it will be used by God for his glory, for his story, if what? If we pray. And so I would call you to do that. Will you pray with me? Lord, increase our faith. We're not asking for a test. We're not dangling our faith in front of you, but we, we believe, help our unbelief. And show us your glory. Father, we pray that, that you will receive our repentance, that you will receive our humble cry to use us, to use our lives, to use our church, that we might be witnesses to the story of God happening in our own lives and the lives around us, in the life of our church. We unify our hearts as you told us to in scripture. We anticipate your movement. We promise to tell the story of how you moved in a powerful way that, that just escapes all description and explanation outside of the fact that your people prayed and God was lifted up. We give you the glory. We give you the glory, all of it. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.